Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. Today we're talking about Theodore Roosevelt, and it had to happen sooner or later. I'm surprised that I held out for 10 shows without giving one completely over to Theodore Roosevelt. Today I'm also trying something a little bit different. For the first time, I have a co-host. It's Professor Benjamin Wetzel, who's joining me for the show as an interviewer and an interviewee. Ben is the author of Theodore Roosevelt, Preaching from the Bully Pulpit, a new book that explores Roosevelt's life through the man's faith, his engagement with world religions, and how his politics address some of the period's most pressing religious issues. I mean, it's hard to believe that we haven't read a book like Ben's before, but as historians of religion often say, this is a persistent blind spot for scholars. And while Roosevelt's evangelical rhetoric pales in comparison to those of his day, this is still a man who told a crowd of progressive followers that they stand at Armageddon and battle for the Lord. There's a great deal of Roosevelt's faith and politics to unpick, and Ben's book is a tremendous effort designed to address these overlooked elements. Ben is professor of American history at Taylor University in Indiana, and I would be remiss if I didn't plug Ben's other work on Protestant ministers from 1860 to 1920. This is a forthcoming book that will also be of interest of listeners, and it dissects the intellectual and theological advocacy of war by mainline Christian ministers. The book's title is going to be American Crusade, which I think hints at the findings and readers that are interested in the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, and the First World War will not want to miss this one. I'll, I'll try and have Ben on for another interview in due course. The second half of the show flips the tables. Ben will be interviewing me on my latest book, Remembering Theodore Roosevelt. This book actually began when I found seven recordings of Roosevelt's contemporaries on magnetic reels, the old system of recording that was most popular in the 1950s and 60s. It turns out that no scholars had ever listened to these recordings. They were created by an oral history project in 1954, and the tapes were used mainly as a transcription aid. But what I found on them was exciting. These were Roosevelt family members that were recalling stories that were rather intimate about each other. There were also recordings by political disciples that told of smoke-filled rooms, and Roosevelt's neighbors described life at Sagamore Hill, his home. In addition to these revelations, the book also includes transcripts that were found in public archives that were part of the Oral History Project, bringing together the work in a single collection for the first time. But we'll get to all that shortly. First, let's get to Professor Wetzel and the first question, which has got to be, why in the world has it taken this long to get a book out about Theodore Roosevelt and religion? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike, and um, thanks again for having me on the, the show. I think part of the answer is simply that Roosevelt um, was involved in so many different aspects of human experience during his time. There's plenty of books on him as an environmentalist, as a hunter, of course, as a politician and explorer that the multifarious character of his life sometimes um, makes it hard for us to see um, even more aspects to it. But I think religion is one of those that has been missed. Um, another part of that answer, I guess, is that he didn't wear his faith on his sleeve in the, the way that some others did. So um, William Jennings Bryan comes to mind as someone whose faith was always out there. He ended his life um, crusading against the teaching of evolution at the, the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee. Um, even compared to William McKinley, um, Roosevelt's faith was more private. And so it's there um, to be sure. Uh, he talks all the time about his the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule as being fundamental parts of his political philosophy. He's a lifelong church attender. He gave a series of lectures at Pacific Theological Seminary in 1911. Um, he taught Sunday school for six years as a, as a teenager and a college student, so it's there. Um, but I think because of his own privacy and Edith's privacy, and because he was doing so many other interesting things that maybe historians haven't given it the attention that it should have. You do a great job, I think, of explaining or giving us like a, a sort of roadmap of where his faith intersects with certain churches. So maybe you could say a little bit about what, I know we can't say what TR's faith was or if he had faith, but we can say that he did belong to some churches. And at one stage, you call him a pan-Christian. I wonder if you could tease that out a little bit for us. So Roosevelt is very um, ecumenical in general in his faith commitments, and he certainly approves of just about every Protestant denomination, and, and for his day, he's pretty tolerant of Catholics as well. 
Uh, in his early years, he, uh, he and his family went to um, Madison Square Presbyterian Church in New York City. And even though he later identified with the Dutch Reformed Church, as a young man, I would say through the end of his college days, he really thought of himself as a Presbyterian. As a teenager then, his family moved um, uptown and they began attending the Dutch Reformed Church there, St. Uh, let's see, Collegiate Reformed Church of St. Nicholas in Manhattan. And uh, that's the denomination as an adult that he'll identify with. That's where he's confirmed um, as a teenager in the church. And that was the ethnic and religious background of Theodore Roosevelt Sr., whereas his mother, Betty, had been a Presbyterian. So Presbyterian, Dutch Reformed, um, but when he gets married uh, for a second time to Edith, uh, Edith's an Episcopalian. And their lifelong church home um, will be at uh, Christ Church and Episcopal Church there on Long Island at Oyster Bay. And so, uh, yeah, he identifies with lots of different denominations. All those three um, they would have in common the kind of high church format, um, a little more of a liturgy. His sensibilities are more um, formal, I guess, or dignified, um, what he prefers. But he's tolerant of a lot of different Protestant denominations, again, of Catholicism, and even comes to see something like Judaism as a valid religion as long as um, Jews are good citizens and good Americans, it doesn't really matter what they believe theologically. You also take this approach to his faith. Um, I'm sort of calling it four-pronged because there's sort of four aspects to it. It's in the book. I've read all about it, but I know listeners will want to hear how those sort of four prongs go to explain TR's religiosity. Sure. Um, so this is the the heart of the book, the, the thesis of the book. So I'll take, take a little more time to unpack this maybe. So I do suggest that there are four aspects of TR's faith that kind of define him as a religious person. The first of these is that he's a religious pilgrim who moves from a devout, um, even quasi-evangelical upbringing to a more detached, but still sincere faith as an adult. Um, so Theodore Sr., very uh, religious, person, great uh, philanthropist, motivated in part by his Christian piety, by his devotion. Um, Mitty, TR's mom, less so, but still supportive of that atmosphere. And that's, that's very much the atmosphere that he grows up in. TR and Corinne and his, his sister and others rec recalled um, memorizing Bible verses as kids, of summarizing the minister's sermon, of certainly going to church every Sunday. Um, this is the kind of religious atmosphere that TR grew up in. Uh, he made the choice, whether out of conviction or a kind of uh, noblesse oblige, that he needed to teach Sunday school um, as a teenager and then um, as a college student at Harvard, which he did his full time at Harvard. Um, this is something that's very sincere and, and meaningful to him. When his father dies in 1878, I think it is, when TR is a sophomore, um, his diary is full. Um, not only of mourning and lament for his father, but also doing so in very Christian ways. He talks about copying hymns or stanzas of hymns into his, his diary um, or into other writings there. Um, he talks about discussing religious topics, of course, in the Sunday school class. He talks about prayer. Um, he talks about all the kinds of markers of Protestant piety for that day and age. Um, and I would say that holds pretty true um, until his tragedy in 1884 when um, his first wife, Alice, and his, his mother die on the same house on the, the same day. And that really rocked his world as a 25-year-old, as of course it would for anybody. Um, but if you look at the way TR grieves after that and compare it to what he had done in 1878, uh, there's very little record of him mourning in any kind of distinctly religious ways. And I say in the book that when TR Sr. had died in 1878, he had gone to the scriptures for comfort, but in 1884, he went to the West. And his experiences in the Dakota Territory as a rancher um, are not particularly religious, at least from the uh, record that's been left to us. And of course, you know, we're, we're of course limited by the sources and what they can and can't tell us. But I would say after that, that time, after that tragedy, his faith seems to be a little less fervent, a little less pious or devout, at least described in traditional ways, a little more detached, but still there. Um, again, a lifelong churchgoer, a contributor to church causes. Um, he starts to doubt some Kind of traditional Christian doctrines at this point later on. I don't know if he ever really comes back to a belief in heaven, for example, even though he had talked about that in his younger days. So the first part of this is TR as a religious pilgrim. The second part of this is TR as a bully pulpit preacher. So he's famous for kind of popularizing that term, 
bully pulpit and uh, especially religious term. And T.R. used the language and morality of the King James Bible all the time in his public addresses to exhort his fellow citizens to what he thought of as good works. And it's just shocking to me today, um, even I myself, someone who grew up in the church, how well T.R. knew the Bible. He's just able to reference obscure passages in the Old Testament in books like Judges and Second Kings and uh, places like this. Um, he just assumes that his readers or his listeners are going to know what he's talking about. So he talks about the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule. Okay, those are things that we're going to accept. Um, most people would still sort of recognize this in the Bible, but also a lot of passages people wouldn't recognize. Um, and then I mean, maybe the best example of this maybe is 1912 when he's talking about standing in Armageddon and battling for the Lord at that Republican convention and Progressive Party convention. And I would argue that that's actually not an anomaly for him, maybe the apocalyptic languages, but the use of the Bible, the use of religious imagery, um, the use of the scriptures, that's something that he's done throughout his whole life if people are actually paying attention to the kind of language, imagery, and rhetoric that he's been using. So the second part of this is he's, he's such a Victorian in his emphasis on morality um, and sort of Bible-based morality. Um, um, so that's yeah, the kind of second part is him as a bully pulpit preacher. The third part um, is TR as a religious ecumenist or someone who promoted a variety of denominations, as I've already touched on, um, including uh, for his day, uh, quite tolerant attitudes toward Roman Catholicism and towards even some non Christian religions like Judaism. Um, Roosevelt essentially came to discount theology as being important at all. He saw nothing but endless squabbles throughout church history over doctrines, over dogma, over the interpretation of this text or that text. And he came to believe, I, I would argue, that theology was virtually meaningless. Instead, what religion was good for, what Christianity in particular was good for, was raising up good citizens um, with good morals to um, lead the country in a direction that he thought it needed to be led. And so for him, it didn't matter if you were Episcopalian, Quaker, Baptist, you know, Presbyterian, et cetera, et cetera, as long as you did good works and good deeds. Um, and he'll come to say, um, you know, at, at the end of his life, that I leave it to profess theologians, versus whether a person is saved by his faith or by his works. Well, that's a pretty fundamental Christian doctrine, and he didn't care about it. What he cared about was people doing good things, um, which for him meant um, having large families, supporting the United States, um, being ethical and moral in one's private and public dealings. And so whatever the merits of that, however, listeners kind of judge that, um, he, he was happy for any church to do that, including the Catholic Church, which was still widely suspect as uh, loyal to the Pope and not supportive of democratic institutions, and including something like uh, Judaism, um, which was at least monotheist um, and relied on the Old Testament and was therefore acceptable in um, the kind of Protestant Catholic Jew framework. And he almost anticipates Will Herberg's famous formulation of this in the 1950s by kind of saying something um, along those lines in the turn of the 20th century. Then the last part of the thesis or the, the four-pronged approach is TR as a defender of the separation of church and state. This is the probably one that I deal the least with in the book, but it's worth noting that he was a lifelong opponent of funding for private parochial schools, a, a strong supporter of public schools um, and their non-sectarian character, even though they were vaguely religious still in his, his day. Um, he also, during his time as president, tried to get the phrase, in God we trust, taken off the coins when they were being redesigned. Oh, that went nowhere in early 20th century America. But he tried to defend it in the terms of that it was sacrilegious to combine God and mammon, that these things needed to be separated. Um, and then maybe most famously, um, at least for TR scholars, this Maria Storer affair that happens when he's president, where there's um, a wife of an ambassador, Bellamy Storer, his wife is Maria. They're both Catholic converts, especially Maria is very zealous for the cause of the promotion to Cardinal of Archbishop John Ireland in Minneapolis. And she writes letters to TR and to McKinley and to Taft, trying to get this to happen. And eventually, um, you know, TR is willing to do what he can behind closed doors to promote Ireland's cause, but he, he can't be seen as a public official of the United States trying to interfere in the Catholic Church's hierarchy and business. And so 
he ends up firing Bellamy Story because of Maria's letters and her continual advocacy for Ireland's cause. And so I think that's another example of TR being a strong defender of the separation of church and state. Yeah, that ecumenical um, <clears throat> prong is, is another really interesting one as well. I mean, he's got a fascinating relationship with the Roman Catholic Church. He meets the Pope. I, I think he talks about kissing the Pope's ring, and you mentioned that in your book. And then he also has run-ins with Catholic leaders in the U.S. as well. And also there's, there's questions about nepotism in terms of promoting certain bishops. Tell us a little bit about TR's relationship with Catholicism and the Roman Catholic Church. What are the highlights and what are some of the, the, uh, the, the key episodes that we need to know about? Yeah, so um, he does meet the Pope, I guess meet maybe not quite the right term. He at least um, sees the Pope as a child when he's in Europe, and I think he'd be, he kisses the ring or whatever. Um, so he has this interaction at a formative point in his young life. Um, later on, when he's coming back from his safari in Africa and he's going through Europe, uh, this is 1910, before he comes back to the United States, he tries to actually have an official audience with the Pope. And uh, the Pope's conditions are that he not meet with the Methodists in Rome. And those are unacceptable conditions to TR. And after failed negotiations, he doesn't meet the Pope at all. And it kind of turns into a minus, minor tempest in the teapot. So on the one hand, he's not deferential to the Pope or to the Catholic Church, and he retains some traditional Protestant suspicions of uh, the Catholic Church and its hierarchy and so forth. But for his day, and the point I would rather highlight, I think, is that he had a pretty good working relationship with several Catholics, including um, Archbishop John Ireland in uh, Minneapolis. And uh, another great example is his relationship with Father John Zong of the University of Notre Dame, who is a partner with him in his Brazilian expedition in 1913-1914. And Zom is one of the key planners of the trip, and he was a supporter of TR in 1912, and they have similar views about reconciling evolution and Christianity and things like that. Now that relationship does go downhill once they're in Brazil because Zom wants to be carried around on a sedan chair, and he won't do his share of the work, and he's just made himself obnoxious to the rest of the, the party down there, so TR has to kind of quietly ship him back. Um, but the fact that he was even willing to cooperate at this level with a Catholic priest in 1913, 1914 was really um, exceptional and would have brought him and actually did bring him into some disrepute um, with kind of the hotter sort of Protestants who thought any cooperation with, with Rome was problematic. So he's not in favor of parochial schools. Again, he doesn't kind of kowtow to the Pope, but he does believe that Catholics can be good Americans, that they can be good citizens and use their votes, right? There's that piece. Um, but that they shouldn't be judged just because their theology is different. And he says in, in private that I have no sympathy with the Roman Catholic view of church government or its celibate clergy or things like that. Um, but as doers of good works, um, and here I'm paraphrasing, it's kind of hard to beat the Catholics for, for what they're doing. So again, everything's kind of on a scale or everything's sort of relative. But for his day, he's got, he's got pretty tolerant views. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, there's there's a few friends that I've been looking into recently, including Charles Patrick Neal, who is a, a professor at the Catholic University of America. And, and TR makes a lot of connections with uh, the Catholic University of America in his time in D.C. Um, so there's some really interesting connections. And I think you're right. Historians haven't really delved deep enough into that. I don't think they've also delved deep enough into this public-private divide, which your book really captures well. I mean, there's presidents like McKinley who talk about kneeling down, praying to God for guidance on what to do with the Philippines and coming up with answers. You know, TR doesn't do any of that. Is the impression from the public at the time that he doesn't take faith as seriously as a result? Well, uh, there are questions, I think, throughout his life and certainly after his death um, about the extent of his faith and um, whether or not he was a, a Christian. So I'll spin this a little bit, um, thinking about his, his, his afterlife, so to speak. Of course, it's something you know a lot about, uh, having written on this, but um, Christian Reisner was a Methodist minister who in the early 1920s was seeing all these books about TR come out, and there's this whole genre of this, I knew TR, my friendship with TR, you know, my recollections of talks with TR. And Reisner noticed the religion is really not anywhere in those, and it's disturbing to him. And um, he makes uh, it his project to find out Roosevelt's religion to make the case, which he does in about 400 pages, that this is like 1922, that TR is, in fact, a Christian. He interviews family members, 
he scours his writings and he comes up with this case that you know, religion was really central to who TR is. Um, but that's been really contested historiographical territory. And I would say Reisner's book doesn't hold up all that well 100 years later. Um, he relies on testimony from people like Warren G. Harding, who didn't exactly have a close relationship with Roosevelt, and whose own personal integrity was quite suspicious. Um, and if you look later on, you'll see Gamaliel Bradford in the 1930s saying things like, you know, I've read Reisner's book, and I'm not persuaded that Roosevelt had any need for religion because his own ego was sufficient for him to be his god. Things like this. And really modern historians have reached no sharper conclusions. So if you look at um, what's been written even the last 30, 40 years, um, not a lot has been written, but when it's touched on um, from H.W. Brands and from John Milton Cooper and different people, they, they don't really agree on the, the depth of TR's faith. And part of it is because um, you have to look hard for it in some ways. And what he said was not just as traditionally pious or whatever, as we might expect from someone at that time. He's no D.L. Moody. He's no Billy Sunday. He's no William Jennings Bryan or William McKinley. And it's there and it's meaningful. Um, but there is a sense in which um, for really kind of evangelical types of, of Christians, um, they're concerned about his friendship with Catholics. They're concerned about his tolerance for um, non-traditional types of Protestants, his support for Taft, who's Unitarian. Um, and I think there is this kind of lingering suspicion throughout TR's own day and then certainly afterward, just how devoted or sincere he was. But I would argue the preponderance of the evidence is there that Christianity meant something to him. And it's a little bit beyond the historian's purview to maybe tease out exactly what it meant or didn't mean to his heart. But it's definitely there in, in, in terms of evidence. For me, the moment when he seems most fervent, I guess, is that we stand at Armageddon moment in 1912 when he's um, when he's talking about the Progressive Party and breaking away from the Republicans. But I, I thought what your book did really well it was to incorporate some of the religious ideas into the presidency and talk about how some of these ideas guided Roosevelt, particularly foreign policy, I thought was interesting. How did TR's Christian morality or his idea of Christian morality lead into some of his ideas about internationalism, imperialism, you know, overseas colonies, that sort of stuff? Yeah, well, of course, he's a... A strong supporter of empire um, virtually anywhere. And of course, that's where he gets slow marks from most historians today, not without reason. Um, I, I don't see faith as being the main driver of that commitment, but I think it's there in the background. And I think it's combined with a kind of Western cultural supremacy and um, sadly, probably even white supremacy that, that plays into that, that um, even though Christianity is not a Western religion, I think like many of his day and since TR had trouble separating kind of Western democracy, um, United States and Protestant Christianity. I think he did see them all sort of inherently interwoven and intertwined. And thus he was a supporter of missionaries around the world as for a small part, uh, agents who would save souls, but more importantly, probably for him, those who would export Western culture, who would raise up ostensibly backward peoples and make them someday fit for self-government. And that's true in Africa. I think that's true in the Philippines. Um, the U.S. government does make distinctions between Muslim populations in the Philippines and between Christian populations in the, the Philippines in terms of who's capable of self-government, how they get treated and, and things like that. So um, yeah, I don't see it as the main driver for that, but I think it's inextricably bound up with that um, because again, it's hard for him to detach Protestant Christianity from a broader Western culture and then democracy on top of that. So he sees them all as intertwined. And I think it's there as a, as a piece of that. Yeah, it's interesting. And I do know that uh, when he talks to Russian diplomats, he talks about freedom of religion in Russia. How at home does Roosevelt deal with that issue of freedom of religion? You know, does he be, is, he, is he a strong defender? And if so, how does that play out during his presidency? Yeah, so I would give um, three examples of that, I think, during his time as president, um, three different individuals, three different groups. Um, so the first of these um, is that Roosevelt um, promoted or appointed the first ever Jew to a cabinet level position, 1906, when he makes Oscar, Oscar Strauss Secretary of Labor and Commerce. Um, again, this is at a time, early 20th century, where there's um, large amounts of Jewish immigration to the United States. 
as listeners of this podcast will know, and that there is suspicion um, of Jews, not on the level of certainly, you know, Russia and its pogroms and things like that, but there's there's still suspicion of Jews as possible communists, as maybe labor agitators, as not being fully loyal as non-Christians. And Roosevelt does traffic in some of those anti-Semitic stereotypes in private. I won't quote them for the purposes of this, but um, he does have some of those views, but yet he does also, I think, fundamentally believe that everybody should be judged on his or her own, own his or her, her own merits as a person, and that a person's religion should not inherently count against them. And he finds Strauss to be um, a capable leader and someone who he thinks will do a good job as um, a person in his cabinet. So he's not going to let Strauss's Judaism stop um, him from being promoted to that position. The second example um, would be with the case of Mormonism and the election of Reed Smoot to the Senate um, the first couple of years of TR's presidency. Um, Kathleen Flake has written a whole great book about this and the controversy over the seating of Reed Smoot in the Senate. It takes years before the Senate is willing to actually um, consider Smoot worthy enough to have this position. And it has to do with Utah and its Mormonism and its recent abandonment of polygamy and its con kind of control of local communities and things like that. But TR becomes a quiet supporter of Smoot in that. And later on, um, he'll say, um, if Smoot had proven himself worthy, basically, it would be an outrage to turn him out because of his religious belief. And TR never came to like Mormonism, to be honest. He never came to um, see it as a legitimate branch of Christianity. He urged Smoot to no avail to give up his apostleship in the, the Mormon church, which is also an issue of play here, is that Smoot's also a church official in addition to being a senator, and that gets to that separation of church and state bit as well. Um, but he did support Smoot basically on the grounds that um, he's being picked on because of his religion, and that wasn't the American way, that wasn't fair. And the last example would be um, Unitarianism and William Howard Taft, who, of course, TR supports as his successor in 1908, when TR does not run for what essentially would have been a, a third term. And Taft takes it on the chin from some evangelical types and some Pentecostal types for being a Unitarian, that is, um, not believing in the divinity of Christ or the Holy Spirit, and only believing that um, God the Father out of the Trinity was really God. Um, and TR actually gives some explicit coaching to Taft um, in his private correspondence about how he should deal with this. And he tells him basically, invoke Lincoln and invoke Jefferson, both of whom were criticized for their lack of orthodoxy and imply that if they were good enough presidents, then he doesn't have to, then you don't have to answer, you know, specific questions about your faith too. And then showing his knowledge of the Bible, he tells him to quote um, James chapter two um, in the end of chapter one, where we hear about um, one of TR's favorite verses, which is to be doers of the word and not just hearers. And then we get to that passage in chapter two of faith without works is dead. And that works are what matter. Um, and he even tells, I think it's Taft in this, in this context that um, um, he says, I'm, I'm mighty weak on the Lutheran and Calvinistic doctrines of salvation by faith, but I'm a strong believer in the doctrine of works <laughs> by James. And so he coaches Taft around this. And then after the election, he writes his open letter um, to be published, um, basically criticizing anyone who would ask Taft or judge Taft for his religious beliefs that that's not the American way. We have no religious test in the United States. And therefore, what Taft believes is a matter between him and God, and it's not really fit for public consumption. So those would be a few examples of how he kind of defends different marginalized groups. Interesting. It's a pity in some ways that we don't have more evidence about how he felt about world religions, particularly Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and uh, and and other faiths, uh, particularly polytheistic faith faiths, because uh, I think that would have really really disturbed T.R.'s idea of order, which is so much a part of his you know his, his attachment to Christianity. Um, and I know the answer to this part, but I, I want to hear a little bit about what you think. When T.R. died, he had a very austere funeral and services. Uh, how much of that do you think reflects what he wanted or or was this very much Edith's? She seems to be such a driving force in his life, uh, particularly around his personal and private life. How much do you think she is is guiding him in terms of faith? Yeah, great question. Hard to answer definitively, but um, I think Edith's faith is a little more warm hearted, we might say, than than TR's. Um, you know, we just lost uh, Edmund Morris uh, a few months ago. It was a great biographer of TR, his, his great trilogy on TR's life. Well, Edmund Morris's wife, Sylvia Dukes Morris, written a biography of Edith. 
and Sylvia Dukes Morris um, says something like, Edith's faith was disconcerting to mere mortals. <laughs> that, that's not exactly the quote, but it's a sense that, that she was someone who had high standards in her faith, expected that from others. And so Edith is the driving force between them going to that Episcopal Church on Long Island. Um, she takes charge of the children's religious instruction, which is something I try to talk a little bit about in the, the book, how they raise their, their kids, none of whom turn out especially religious, except for Ethel, probably. Um, but Ted Roosevelt um, writes later on in his kind of memoir, All in the Family, that it's the mother who usually takes charge of the children's religious instruction for the story of Owen Wister, one of TR's friends, and TR walking along and TR explaining that the voices coming from the upper story window are Edith teaching the, the kids their Bible instructions and things like that. So um, I don't know specifically about the funeral and how that was planned or who planned that, but it is austere. Uh, I believe there's no music at it. Um, the more interesting part maybe is how the churches around the country remember Roosevelt. And there's all these uh, services, the Protestant Catholic churches, the Jewish synagogues. Um, I talk a little bit about the end of the, the book and um, TR is remembered as a leader of the great American church. Um, he's, uh, I guess, praised um, in a variety of, of ways. Um, and the common hymn selections seem to be uh, from a foundation, uh, which is one of TR's favorite hymns. I think Onward Christian Soldiers is in there as well, which nicely captures the militant part of TR. Um, but yeah, the churches around America have all these memorials for him afterward. Um, yeah, and uh, it's, it's telling. Um, at a time when religion was still very important, churches are still very much the center of um, cultural life, I think, even by 1919, when he passed, that he's going to be remembered there as well. And it's a fascinating book. I think it's something that we as a group of historians have overlooked for far too long. And I'm, I'm immensely grateful that you've pointed it out. I think it also helps round out a little bit of our thinking of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, because to separate religion from the events that are going on in this period is just, it, it does a disservice to the history of the period, I think. Yeah, and again, I think we, well, of course, as historians, we ought to be wary of anachronism and of importing our own society's values, or I should say, ex exporting them back into the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, where, again, Moody and Billy Sunday, they're some of the most popular figures. Um, again, in 1896, I often say that's the, probably the most religious election in American history, where you have, you know, the Presbyterian William Jennings Bryan against the Methodist William McKinley, and both of them are just sort of first rate in terms of documentable religious um, convictions. And so it is, you know, TR is part of that landscape. I think how he speaks into it maybe um, is he can be categorized as part of the social gospel movement that tended to downplay theology and dogma and specific religious convictions in favor of social action. And this, of course, you know, some social gospelers were Democrats and he would have hit heads with them on some things, but I think he broadly fits into that tradition of applied Christianity or social Christianity. And in the early days of the fundamentalist modernist controversy that would split denominations like the Presbyterian Church in the 1920s, TR was definitely on the side of the modernists there. He seemed to have no problem with evolution. Uh, he didn't have a problem with a more, or I should say, a less than literal interpretation of certain scriptural passages if they seem to accord more with modern science or modern sensibilities. And so we definitely don't want to mistake him for a fundamentalist. I think he respected the Bible, believed in the Bible, quoted the Bible all the time but more so as a source of moral instruction than of definitive capital T truth for all time, perhaps. that was authoritative also in science and history. I'm not sure he fully went that way. And it's interesting, and my own mentor, Mark Knoll, has written an article about this, but in 1911, you've got the 300th anniversary of the King James Bible, and you've got speeches from T.R., Woodrow Wilson, and William Jennings Bryan on what the King James Bible means to the world today. And out of those three, William Jennings Bryan is really the only one who talks about any kind of like personal application of the Bible or supernatural parts of the Bible or how the Bible might transform your heart. Wilson and TR have much more instrumental public view of how the Bible is good for communication. Thanks so much for sharing the book with us on the show, Ben. It's really a fantastic read and I think shows up a lot of the gaps that we have in our thinking about this very iconic American figure. And uh, you also agreed uh, to come on the show and ask some questions about my book that came out. And I guess now might be a good time to flip the tables. Well, Mike, it was, it was good to be able to uh, 
read Remembering Theodore Roosevelt. This is a very important work for scholars who are going to um, try to understand TR better, but also his, his memory in the, in the 20th century. So I guess the first question I wanted to ask you, um, having read your other book, Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost, how does this work relate to and differ from um, your, your book, Theodore Roosevelt? Yeah, thanks for the intro. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost was simply an excuse to watch movies and beer commercials. So, <laughs> but uh, the new book is is something that came out of that project. So when I was putting together Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost, I came across this collection of transcripts, oral history transcripts from TR's contemporaries. And these were family, friends, political disciples uh, that had in the 1950s recorded uh, their testimony with uh, TR's great preserver of all things Rooseveltiana was this guy Herman Hagedorn, who was a, a big fan of TR, who really only knew him from the end of his uh, years. I think he met TR in around 1916. World War I brought them together. But after TR died, Hagedorn became the conservator of TR's legacy. And for years after his death, he worked with the, the Roosevelt Memorial Associations, of which there was a men's group and a women's group, and he was the link between the two of them. In the 1950s, he decided to do an oral history collection. And actually, that's he had thought about that before. What I think is so interesting about Hagedorn is that he thought oral history was the most important thing he could collect about TR. He collected everything. I mean, every ephemera. I mean, postcards, photos, videos, everything that was related to TR he had collected. The first thing that he wanted to collect though was oral history testimonies from his contemporaries. And I think that was because he thought that preserving oral history was a way of really connecting the past to the present and for later generations to hear or at least read testimony from firsthand accounts of TR's friends would make the man come alive. And so in the 1950s, he realizes that most of TR's friends and family are dying off and he starts collecting these accounts and he donates a lot of them to Columbia. And I'd say about 50% of the collection was available to researchers for some time. Uh, but what I came across was a tranche of new transcripts and also seven magnetic reel-to-reel -reel recordings that had never been heard before. And how I know they were never heard is because I've asked every, well, three National Park Service rangers who worked at the, the site where the reels were for going back to 1978. And none of them had ever heard them or knew anyone that listened to them. I've asked several biographers if they had read them, including people like Stacey Cordry, who's written about Alice Roosevelt. And she she's read everything that Alice Roosevelt has done. And she said she hadn't listened to these. So for, I, I thought this was a very novel new find. And I hope it sheds some light on some of the more human elements of TR's life, his life with his family, uh, how he how he kind of brought disciples into the fold, whether you were Democrat or Republican, all these stories come out and make him uh, a little bit more of a human character rather than a sort of man on a pedestal like some biographies might do. Well, your book gets us to lots of interesting um, questions with the issue of oral history and memory. Um, and you address this somewhat in the book itself, but I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the problems, challenges, and opportunities of oral history and memory as historical? Yeah, that's a great question because there, there's a lot of problems with these, these testimonies uh, and, and they're all very different. The first, the first problem with the oral histories is that I don't think the participants that were recorded expected the audio to survive. So particularly Alice Roosevelt, I think her expectation was is that she would transcribe well, she would have the, the oral histories transcribed and then she would edit them. And I know for a fact that some of them were, were, were done in that fashion. The Hagedorns edited some of these, Alice Roosevelt would have edited hers, and then the Hagedorns would have re-edited even further to make sure the grammar was all in the right place. And you could tell because there are some, there's some overlap between the audio and the transcripts that the Hagedorns made. And, and so you can tell where there were edits made. So there, there are omissions, and there are things that are, are added then in order to sort of smooth out the edges of, of the, the way we speak as individuals, right? The other problem with these two, and this is something also that Alice Roosevelt alludes to, is, is that people were consciously speaking for posterity. In fact, she says in one of her, her recordings, 
that her father used to write these posterity letters, which we, we, we know Roosevelt did, these letters that he would write to his kids, as, as Alice said, inoculating against biographers that would come along years from, from now and, and try and pick these things apart. So we, we know that Roosevelt did it, TR did it. And we, I think the nod that Alice is making is that she's saying things that you know, she's willing for researchers and historians to pick up on later. Like I said, though, I don't think she was prepared for these audio recordings to remain because there's some really interesting things that she and other family members say in the recordings that it's clear that they don't want this preserved. In fact, uh, some of Alice's cousins say things that are less than discreet about family members, particularly First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt comes in for some pretty nasty criticism and harsh remarks, which are, you know, uh, the cousins say, I hope this isn't being recorded, but of course it is, and now it's it's out there. There's also indiscretions, uh, infidelities, uh, drunkenness, you know, there's a lot of alcohol and substance abuse in the Roosevelt family that gets discussed. And I think one of the things that comes out of this as well is how much more interesting the Roosevelt women are and how much they've been overlooked. And I know we've got a great biography of the Roosevelt women by Betty Boyd Caroli, but the women are still overlooked. And what these oral histories do is show just how limited the lives of the men were in comparison to the women who lived longer and really were the bedrock of that family and, and, the, and also the network that the Roosevelt's represent. Alice Roosevelt Longworth is an interesting character, of course, in her own right, an interesting character in this book. Um, you know, I, and so she talked about her reticence to talk about some private things. And I wonder, in a sense, is she still in the 50s, 60s, 70s operating in kind of Victorian mentality? Is she sort of the rest of the Victorians? Have we maybe underestimated the extent to which some of these cultural phenomena persisted? I'm thinking, too, of the story told of Bammy, T.R.'s sister, insisting on her daily tea the day before her death at the appointed hour, because that's just what you do in this kind of culture. Can you speak to that at all? I think it challenges a lot. I think you're right. It challenges this sort of intergenerational divide. I mean, one of the things that Alice talks a lot about is some of her, her fondest memories are sharing days out with younger generations and not just one, but having multiple generations. She talks, in fact, I got in touch with one of her, uh, her nieces uh, who her, she herself was writing a memoir about her life. And in one of the conversations that Alice talks about, she goes on these um, these birthday parties with the younger generations and they bring everyone out. And th these are moments for the family to sort of weld their bonds of fidelity to each other. And it's remarkable. The other, the other thing I would say about their sort of intergenerational uh, lives that span, you know, 80, 80 odd years is that you can see the, the changing gender dynamics and the politics of gender in America with these women. So Bammy, for example, uh, was politically very active. Alice says at one stage she, she could have been president of the United States if she wanted to or was allowed to. She didn't want to be, and she didn't think that women should vote. And, and Corinne Roosevelt Robinson, who's the first woman to nominate uh, so a, a man, a male candidate, but any candidate uh, in, a, in a Republican national convention, the first woman to do that, she also doesn't believe women should vote. And some of the other women in the, in the, in the oral histories like uh, Georgiana Farr Sibley, she says that this seems outdated to her by the times of the, like, the 1960s and 70s, but in that moment, it reflected the way that these women felt empowered because they were part of a strong family. And also this is an elite family as well. It's a politically connected family. So there's a little bit of class involved with that too. The other thing I would say is, is that some of the events, like you're talking, you mentioned there, um, Bammy on, on her deathbed, she sort of still wants to have tea the day that she dies. And she brings all the family around to, to have tea. And they did maintain these sort of rituals that, and Alice does this as well. Alice is a, a night owl. I mean, all her life, she, she stays up late reading and smoking cigarettes and she doesn't wake up until like 11 o'clock. She doesn't have any food until like midday. And they have these, these strange rituals that are a product of their class, their upbringing, and also their freedom. I mean, they, because they're wealthy and because they, um, they've been well-educated, they have this freedom to explore politics. I mean, Alice spent a lot of time in, uh, in, in Congress watching from the gallery, uh, and and so and so did a lot of these these Roosevelt women. So they're they're fascinating on a number of levels. I think. 
Uh, did you have a favorite interview out of all these or one that you felt was most revealing in understanding the world of the Roosevelt? Uh, well, there's a lot of new stuff, but my favorite is Barkley Farr, who was a friend of Kermit Roosevelt. And I think we've read over the years so many biographies, and you've even mentioned it as well with uh, Roosevelt's ability to memorize Bible verses. We, you know, we've heard about tr has got this incredible memory, and he was he was so charming, and and uh, and he was he was able to bring sort of political disciples on board with just a few words. And what Barclay Farr's testimony does is it shows exactly how that happens, and and how he was so magnetic. As a, as a personality. So uh, this was Kermit Roosevelt's friend. So he was, uh, he was around at the White House when TR was president and he got into some really silly hijinks. I mean, they, they raided the pantry on a, on a holiday weekend and they, they ate all the food and destroyed parts of the White House. And you, know, you would think the president would be outraged because he can't entertain his guests. And, but no, he just, he kind of laughed. And Barkley Farr talks about how he never once saw TR scold his kids, even, even though, I mean, some of the stories, you know, lighting off fireworks in neighbors' houses and, you know, some really dangerous and stupid things that kids do, uh, I've certainly yelled at my kids about, but TR just doesn't, doesn't do that. He, he laughs at it. And there's a real warmth and a, I think a, an understanding about how he deals with family there. There's also a really interesting story that Barkley Farr tells about bringing TR to Princeton University campus when he's running as a progressive in 1912. And that's that's Woodrow Wilson's neck of the woods, and you know he he admits that he, he didn't win anyone over on the day, but for the people that were already big fans of TR, they just thought the world of him, and and, and seeing him there on on Princeton's campus was a, was a big deal to to the sort of Republican faithful of of that day. Um, so that to me was that also happened to be the first interview that Hagedorn was a party to. And it's the one that sets off the whole oral history project. So it's in terms of an entryway into someone who is so peripheral to TR's life, and yet she gives us this really great portrait of a person who we often see as a president or as a politician or, you know, just a big toothy grin with a mustache. This, this really gives you a much different human picture of who that person was. A lot of the memories of TR are very positive. There are some unflattering stories told. I'm thinking particularly of Murray Quigg's story on pages 207 to 208. Um, he's got a really negative story about TR, and there's some other un unflattering elements that come out in this too. Um, could you talk to us about those stories a little bit? Well, I think first of all, they picked people that they thought would craft a positive image of TR. That was always Hagedorn's plan. He, I mean, Hagedorn was a hagiographer. I mean, that's what he, that's what he, he does. But that said, I think they didn't expect that the these oral, these sort of audio tapes would have survived. So there's some some indicators there about how these how these people really thought about TR, the Roosevelt family, and the politics of the period. And there there is some clear issues with the politics of New York, particularly. You know, there's stories in there about how TR didn't get on with Charles Evan Hughes mainly because of a, of a silly spat that was really down to local Republican politics uh, and how TR always kept his hand in that local New York scene, that New York City scene. And it was a dirty scene. I mean, it was, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people vying for political uh, sort of supremacy there. And that uh, Lemanuel Quigg story is very much one of them. I mean, this, this uh, Quigg was one of the movers and shakers uh, closely associated with Thomas Boss Platt. The Republican boss in New York State at that at the time, TR was sort of rising up to governor and then eventually to vice president. And the the Quig the Quig dynamics show that you know you you got to keep your friends close and your enemies closer, and you don't really know who those are. I mean, Quig at one stage was advocating for TR to become the next vice president, but also was probably doing that in order to move him out of New York City and sort of you know. I suppose edge edge him out of state politics and make him less of a of a force of progressive change in the state. So it's it's interesting to see that. I, I think it's equally as interesting to see how some family members um, think of TR. Uh, you know his his positive traits alongside some of his his negative traits. Alice, for example, talks about um, her father making some mistakes, which is I suppose not uncommon 
you know, in how we think about Alice and her relationship with her father. Um, there are some real, you know, personal traumas between them, particularly the death of her mother and the fact that TR never talks about those things. Um, but there's also differences too in around foreign policy. I mean, Alice at once is an isolationist in the 1920s and then later on becomes this sort of diehard anti-communist in the 1950s. And she's sort of navigating her father's legacy through that as well. Um, so the, the best thing about these stories is that we have audio that explains the, how these people actually uh, phrased their, their testimony and their accounts of TR. And then we also have the transcripts. And if you compare the two of them, you can see the differences and where there's discrepancies and then tease out what, what they were probably getting at. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned in here sometimes about um, the tapes themselves having lost some quality or being hard to identify particular people who are referenced. Um, I'm curious about your methodology, how you tried to track down um, some of the names you mentioned or even some of the parts of the tape that are hard to hear. Uh, I've asked I've asked friends a lot of, for a lot of help. Uh, so names eluded me for so long. Uh, there's a Polish diplomat at one stage who it took me I'd say easily two months to figure out who this Polish diplomat was. And you know, once I said the name to a friend of mine who works on Polish history, or he is Polish, he works on Ukrainian history. Uh, it was like straight away, you know, you could Wikipedia this guy and figure out, oh, this is why this person is so important. There's those eureka moments, and then there's also moments where you have to give up. I mean, my ear was literally, uh, you know, glued to the headset, trying to hear a little bit better what Alice Roosevelt was saying, or what, uh, or, or or what um, her cousins were saying, and their accents are so old worldy. I mean, Alice Roosevelt, it's like Catherine Hepburn on speed. You know, she is just talking so quickly and with this you know, accent that just makes you think of a, a New York that just isn't there anymore. So that was difficult. And, and again, it was her niece that helped explain a little bit about, uh, about what she was saying. And, and, and so some things though, they just got left out. When I couldn't decipher what, what the speakers were saying, I just had to leave it out because I wasn't confident enough about sharing that. But the good news is, is that these tapes are digitized now. And if researchers really want to hear what Alice Roosevelt sounds like, they can they can appeal to the National Park Service or co contact me directly, and I can share some of those with you. In fact, I put something up on YouTube recently to just give you a sense of what Alice Roosevelt sounded like because it is it's outrageous. Um, and and so th those were the main struggles. The, the one other struggle that I would say that I had with the project was deciding what would go in and what would stay out. There's some really funny stories that I left out because they're just anecdotal and they don't really, they don't really do anything to the you know, sort of broader sense of what TR was about or what the book is trying to achieve. And I think, again, if, if those researchers wanna go and, and listen to the tapes, they'll find some really interesting stories that Alice Roosevelt particularly shares about where communists were really hiding out during the 1950s. She thought they were in dentist's office. It, that there was Chinese and Soviet communists in dentist office. Anyway, uh, weird stuff. Well, it's great to be here, Mike. It was great to get a chance to read your book and to be able to talk about yours and mine. And um, I've enjoyed listening to the episodes in your podcast. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how this develops over time. So thanks a lot for having me. Thanks a million, Ben. And also thanks for experimenting with the format of the show this week. It's uh, It's been great to talk a little bit about my stuff, but I just have to say to everyone listening, you know, religion is such an important part of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Ben Wetzel's book is really, I mean, if I could have named the podcast The World of Theodore Roosevelt, I, I could have done a lot more on, on TR and I probably would have, but Ben, your, your book is, is I think it, it goes a long way to help understand politics and religion in the late 19th and early 20th century. And yeah, thanks a million for, for sharing and, and giving your time to the podcast this week. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.